Hello, I'm Alan Taddei and this is Start Karting, an introduction to the sport including a step-by-step -step guide on everything you will need to do to pass your ARCS novice driver test and plenty of information so you can get out safely on the track at your first kart meeting. The sport has come a long way since American Art Engels invented the first kart capable of 25 miles an hour. Over 50 years on and today's karts are high-tech, high-spec racing machines with cadets at 50 miles an hour up to supercarts capable of speeds in excess of 140 miles an hour. As with all forms of motorsport worldwide, administration is carried out by the FIA, which in turn gives authority to the CIK. They pass on UK administration to the Royal Automobile Club Motorsport Association, the MSA, to carry out ultimate administration. The MSA controls all areas of four-wheeled British motorsport from their headquarters at Colnbrook near Slough. Hopefully by now you've already visited your local kart club, had a good look at the most popular classes racing there and chosen a class to suit your age and size. The most popular classes are detailed in the kart race yearbook and the minor classes are listed on the MSA website. Of the most popular classes, the Bambino class is for 6 to 8 year olds using an all weather tyre and offers the opportunity for the youngest drivers to learn about kart control. From 8 years of age you can move into the cadet classes and there are both 4-stroke and 2-stroke options. The Honda 4-stroke engine is the more economical of the two but the racing is just as competitive. The 2-stroke options include the IAMI cadet class which is currently the official MSA British Championship class for cadets. Both carts are started using a pull cord. The engines use a centrifugal clutch system which allows the engine to run without the cart moving. To stop the engine, simply flick the on-off switch to the off position. Juniors can race from age 11 and there are both direct drive and tag options. A direct drive engine is an engine connected directly to the rear axle so the wheels have to be turning for the engine to run. The rear of the cart has to be lifted off the ground before pushing it and then releasing it onto the ground which starts the engine. To stop the engine you simply press the brake and come to a standstill. TAG stands for touch and go and is an engine with an onboard battery and starter. To start the engine you simply press the starter button. To stop it you simply press the engine kill switch. The direct drive and TAG options are available in both junior and senior variations. As a novice you can start racing in senior classes when you're age 16. Seniors can race in gearbox carts, usually either 125 or 250cc two-strokes. These carts can race on both kart circuits and longer circuits like Silverstone, Brands Hatch or Alton Park. They use sequential gearboxes and are capable of speeds in excess of 140 miles per hour. Always visit your local club where you're going to race and see which classes are most popular. It's always more fun racing against a big grid. To find your local kart club and circuit or for more information about the sport, check out the MSA and ABKC websites. Modern carts can be fitted with such things as data logging devices that can help you achieve the best possible performance from your cart, mapping circuits with built-in GPS capabilities to show where you can gain extra time when racing, and a screen fitted to your steering wheel showing your lap times, engine RPM, engine temperature and a whole host of other information. Driving is just part of the job. Understanding and using the data during a race weekend can make a significant difference in your lap times. Now we've looked at the cart itself, well what about the gear you're going to need when you go racing? Well you'll need a suit and these are not the same as racing car suits. A cart suit needs to have a CIK label or you could wear a leather suit for both short and long circuit karting and you'll need a pair of boots with adequate ankle protection plus you're going to need some gloves. Racing gloves generally have suede palms ideal for the job and there are now wet weather gloves available for when it's raining. Finally, of course, the crash helmet, which has to have the appropriate Snell Motorsport standard. And before you do your first race, you will need to get one of these stickers from your scrutineer at your first race meeting. If you're under the age of 15, you must use a Snell CMR 2007 Youth Helmet Standard. To protect your hearing, you should wear earplugs. That's all the important equipment that you'll need to wear when you go racing on a cart. Obviously, it makes sense to buy the best you can possibly afford, but always check the regulations to make sure your purchases comply and are in date.
And don't forget that wet weather gear, including a rainproof suit, overboots and gloves are essential. Now, whether you're driving an F1 car or a cart, it's vital to know your machinery. It's also essential that you're comfortable to allow complete control. So let's start right at the beginning, getting into the cart. Start by standing in the seat and then feeding yourself down, making sure not to touch any of the hot engines or exhaust components. And then feed yourself in, making sure that as you climb in, your heels miss the important track rods and feed yourself down into the seat, which should be tight and secure. And of course, it's important to hold the steering wheel in the correct position. Don't put your hands at the top of the wheel, but hold it in a 10 to 2 or quarter to 3 position with a light but positive grip for maximum control. Now, of course, this cart is comfortable for the driver. His legs are nicely bent and he's not having to stretch to use either the accelerator pedal or the brake pedal, which of course should be used independently. And if you're in the correct seating position, your feet will be upright, not splayed out. That's very important. Now from time to time in motor racing you are going to crash whatever formula you are in. Now in the event that that crash is a front end impact that can have a violent effect on the front wheels which feeds through to the steering wheel. If this happens it can injure your thumbs. The correct procedure if you know you're heading for a front end impact into a barrier or tyres is to move your thumbs from inside the steering wheel to outside the steering wheel whilst maintaining a positive grip. It's one of the reasons you will see Formula One drivers when they're about to crash from onboard footage take their hands off the steering wheel. It saves injuring their thumbs. They of course are held in by seat belts. You're not so you still have to hold on to the wheel. Now starting a cart is one thing but you've also got to stop it and how you do so depends on whether your cart has a clutch fitted or not. If it doesn't have a clutch you stop the cart by stalling it with a brake pedal. If it does you turn the engine off as seen in the example here on the left or press the engine kill switch as seen in the example on the right. Now clearly there's more to driving a cart than just pressing a few pedals and turning a steering wheel. Mental and physical preparation are essential if you're going to drive precisely and smoothly for lap after lap. Let's take a look at some driving techniques. Perfecting the racing line involves positioning the cart on the approach to the corner, progressive braking, well-timed synchronised acceleration and accurate turn-in at apexes and exit points. Track position and entry speed is critical because you must be able to get your cart turned in precisely, enabling you to accurately clip the apex of the corner. In this example, the cart arrowed is taking a normal wide racing line into a tight hairpin. This cart is taking a narrower defensive line. The cart taking the wider line into the turn can break smoothly and hit the apex. The other cart misses the apex, running wide on the exit, allowing the overtake. Oversteer is a situation where the rear wheels give up their grip. The driver must have their wits about them as only speed of correction will prevent oversteer leading to a spin. Opposite lock should be applied in the direction of the slide and matched with either the reduction of the brake or throttle input depending on which triggered the oversteer. Cart control is a skill that can only be developed with practice. The trick is always to look in the direction of the way you want to go regardless of the direction your cart is pointing. Understeer is where the front wheels give up their grip and this is generally caused by entering the corner too quickly. In this example the cart is heading straight on mid-corner. The driver has to reduce throttle and steering input in order to make the turn. The instant your cart has a problem or you know you're going to come to a halt you must raise your arm in the air to warn other competitors and make sure your arm is clearly raised. In this example, the cart arrowed has lost a chain, but the driver fails to put his arm in the air to warn the drivers behind he is coming to a halt, resulting in the cart behind running into him. In this example, the cart in front is coming into the pits, having received a black flag. The driver raises his arm, but it is raised too late and not high enough for the driver behind to see, resulting in him being contacted from behind. Raise your arm clearly and early when you know you have a problem and are stopping, are slowing for a red flag or leaving the circuit. If your cart does stop out on the circuit, get out of the cart and move it to safety off the track but only if you are able to do so safely. The priority is for you to go and stand in a place of safety like a marshal's post. 
If you can restart your cart safely, do so, but be aware of oncoming carts. You are not allowed to make repairs or adjustments except in the pit lane or other designated maintenance areas. If your cart is broken down, you or your mechanic will have to push or use the trolley to fetch the cart back to the pits at the end of the race unless the circuit has a pickup service as in the case here. Always obey the instructions of officials and marshals at all times. When lifting your cart from the ground to a trolley, make sure you do it correctly with bent knees. This is correct, this is incorrect and will result in an injured back. A regular problem you will encounter when racing is being forced off the racing line by avoiding another competitor or moving out to overtake. Both are hazardous as grip levels are considerably reduced by small pieces of tyre rubber swept offline, commonly called marbles. Braking distances have to be amended as will the point at which power has to be reapplied. Failure to make allowances may mean loss of control and even if you don't spin it will lead to a loss of momentum and hard won race places. If you leave the circuit don't brake sharply unless you are heading straight for a barrier. Ease back on the throttle, hold the steering wheel with a very light grip and gently nudge your cart back onto the circuit. In the exceptional situation of a brake failure there is usually very little time to react but try and put the cart into a spin to slow it down. If the throttle is stuck in the full open position immediately switch off the engine with the kill switch or pull the plug cap off. Don't forget if you have a problem raise your arm as soon as you can to warn other competitors. A clean overtaking manoeuvre is the result of a fast exit out of a preceding corner and then making use of the slipstream from the cart in front. The driver uses the extra momentum gain to pull off this clean fair passing manoeuvre. When overtaking you must be decisive. It's your responsibility as the driver making the manoeuvre to overtake cleanly while the driver being overtaken should stick to the racing line. In this incident neither driver made the finish as the result of over assertive driving. Overtaking cleanly is perhaps the most difficult skill to learn. You need to be 90% alongside the other driver before you can safely claim the corner. Otherwise the driver may turn in on you or may not see you and recriminations will follow. Remember there will be observers watching your driving when racing. Your diet and fitness is absolutely essential if you're going to compete at the highest level in the UK, not least because UK drivers regularly compete and we're not only at domestic level but at European and World Championship level as well. If you're going to compete against the best you need to dedicate yourself to a lifestyle that will help you to do that and don't forget to do some reading on sports psychology and the techniques top athletes around the world use to improve their performances. If the driver next to you on the grid is closing his eyes and going through a process known as visualisation and you're not, he will probably have a performance edge over you. Now when you race in the UK there is one certainty you are going to be racing in the wet from time to time. To exploit a wet track the driver must be able to drive with a huge degree of finesse. Control applications must be smooth, gentle and progressive. Just like F1 cars, carts have both slick and wet weather treaded tyres, except Bambino which uses an all weather tyre. Visibility in the wet is greatly reduced and special visors or applications can be used to reduce the spray obscuring your vision. You only have to look at this onboard footage to see how difficult it is to see when driving in the wet. Loss of grip and traction mean that braking distances must be greatly increased. On a wet track it may be advantageous to drive off the racing line to find that extra grip. Watch here as the driver leading this trio and the driver at the back of the group take a wide line through the tight hairpin giving up the apex taken by the driver in the middle. Although the middle one of the three initially makes an overtake the drivers taking the wider line through the turn get better traction on the outside allowing them to get the power down earlier than the other driver and gain the place back in the case of the leader of the trio and make a place up in the case of the driver originally at the back of the group. Have you ever noticed that when you wash your car and it's nicely cleaned and polished it seems to drive much better? It's the psychological effect of knowing your equipment is prepared as well as it can be and when racing if you know your cart is well maintained and looks good it's likely to have a similar psychological effect on you or your driver. Let's take a moment to look at some of the simple maintenance requirements of a cart. 
Always check the wheel nuts are tight, ideally use a torque wrench and change them frequently. Check the tyre pressures, ask your dealer if you're not sure what pressures to use. They may be different for hot and cold weather or for the wet weather treaded tyres. Check the chain has some slack around 1 to 1.5 centimetres is about right and always spray it with chain wax between sessions or races. Every so often check all the nuts and bolts are tight, especially the ones that hold the engine onto the cart. Make sure there is some rotation movement on the rose joints at the ends of the steering rods at all angles of the steering wheel. Check the brake pedal does not have excessive movement. If it does the brake pads may need adjusting or replacing. Check that the mandatory brake safety cable is correctly adjusted and also that the throttle pedal hits the stop at the same time as full throttle is obtained. Finally, make sure there is enough fuel in the cart for the next race or practice session. Now, just what does it take to go fast? Well, take a look at any good driver and they will seem to be putting in very little effort and yet they go faster than anyone else and invariably end up winning. This is because they've mastered the three elements of speed, smoothness, accuracy and consistency. Now if you can concentrate and train on these aspects of your driving, speed will naturally feel right. If on the other hand you try to force the pace, you'll tend to make more errors. Now as a novice you must respect your personal limits and remember to finish first, first you must finish. Or a spectacular victory and he doesn't look he's not even working that hard he's allowing the cart to coax him through the corners he's got Now to obtain your competition license you must pass a half day test run by members of the Association of Racing Cart Schools or by club examiners at participating clubs. Now it's a good idea to get some practice in before your test and to read the regulations which are included in the pack and available online. The MSA Yearbook is a complete companion of regulations, procedures and technical details for all UK motorsport. It's also the reference used by officials and race organisers when settling a dispute. So as a competitor it is vital that you have a good working knowledge of the sections that will apply to you when you go racing, which are included in your pack. In your starter pack you'll also find the MSA Kart Race Yearbook. The Kart Race Yearbook contains the technical information you will need for all of the most popular classes in karting. There are also comprehensive lists of ARCs, test centres and qualified club examiners. Make contact with the one you want to go to and remember when you attend your ARCs test you will need to bring with you your licence application form which is in the pack with all relevant sections completed including your signature and a passport photo. After signing on, you will join your examiner or instructor for a driver's briefing. He or she will show you this video and go over all the points you will need to know to pass your test. If you have chosen to hire equipment, the school can provide you with the correct racewear before your driving assessment. The examiner will be looking for the correct use of the racing line, smooth braking and use of the throttle and awareness of other traffic. Before you go out, check that you and your cart are over the minimum weight for your particular class. Do not try to drive too quickly, but remember you will be timed to be sure you are fast enough to race safely. Just remember to relax and drive smoothly. In order to pass your driving assessment, you must pass all of the overall headed requirements and a high percentage of the rest. From the track, you will go back into the test centre to do a written questionnaire, where you will have to answer multiple choice questions on the points covered in this presentation. You must know the meanings of all the flags used on the circuit and you must score a high percentage on the other questions in order to pass. But don't worry, you can resit either assessment at a later date should you fail. If you've passed, you can complete your race application, get it stamped and signed by the examiners and get it posted off to the MSA at Motorsports House with a photograph. Alternatively, if you're under 18 years of age, you do not need a medical examination, so if you're planning to race in the following day or so, you can use the application form with the correct licence fee in place of a licence for your first race. If you're 18 or over, or cannot answer all of the medical self-declaration questions, you must have a medical by your GP or other qualified doctor before sending the form into the MSA. In addition, if you're under the age of 18, your parent or guardian must also take out a licence called the PG Entrant Licence. The form is in the pack.
Flag signals are used in all motorsports to communicate to the driver and are more or less universal worldwide. Understanding their meaning forms an important part of any driver's knowledge and you will be tested on the flags in the exam paper. So let's have a look at the flag signals used in karting. Some may be used anywhere on the track, such as a marshal's post, and others, such as a last lap board or a warning flag, only at the finish line. At some circuits, we're now seeing the growing use of specialist light signals to supplement or even replace flags. A stationary blue flag or static light, another competitor is following close behind. Waved flag or flashing light, another competitor is trying to overtake. In karting, the blue flag or light is often only used to warn carts about to be lapped. A stationary yellow flag or static light, danger, slow down sufficiently to ensure that full control of the cart can be retained. No overtaking. A waved yellow flag or flashing yellow light, great danger, no overtaking, slow down considerably and be prepared to suddenly change direction from the projected racing line or take other evasive action including stopping if necessary. Stationary yellow and red striped flag or static light, slippery surface ahead, waved or flashing light, slippery surface imminent. Green flag, usually stationary but can be waved or a static or flashing light, all clear at the end of a danger area controlled by yellow flags and also shown at all posts during the start of a practice session or the first formation lap of a race. A stationary red flag or light immediately cease driving at racing speed proceeds slowly without overtaking and with maximum caution to the pits or where indicated. You should raise your arm when you first see the red flag to warn following competitors that you are slowing. A flag or light, black with an orange disc, displayed with a number positioned at the start line, a warning of apparent mechanical failure or fire. The driver concerned must call in at the pits for repair. A black and white flag or light split diagonally and displayed with the cart number positioned at the start line, a warning to the driver that his or her driving standard is suspect and that they may be black flagged on further reports. Black flag or light with number positioned at the start line, the driver must stop in the pits within one lap of receiving the signal and report to the clerk of the course. Penalty of exclusion may be enforced. A green flag or light with a yellow chevron, this is unique to karting and is used to signal a full start. Slow down and take up the start formation again. Yellow and black quartered flag, the race leader who will act as a pace cart must slow down to a rolling lap safe speed and all competing carts must line up in order behind with no overtaking. This flag is used if the track is partially obstructed or an accident is being investigated. When the safety period is over, the flags are withdrawn and racing restarts when a waved green flag is shown at the start line. A stationary white flag or static light, a slow moving cart, service car or other slow moving vehicle such as an ambulance is on the circuit. If the start lights fail then the start can be signalled by the use of the national flag, for instance the union flag which is swiftly raised for rolling starts or held up and then dropped to signal a standing start. Probably the best known of all flags is the black and white checkered positioned at the start finish line and used to signal the end of the race. So you've passed your ARCS test, you've got your race licence and joined a kart club, now it's time for your first race. Before you go, make sure you've signed your new licence and remember to bring your licence upgrading card from the Blue Book, complete with photo and your signature to the meeting for upgrade signatures from the steward. You will need to fit a transponder to your cart which automatically times your race. You can either purchase one of these or sometimes hire one from the club for a modest fee. Race meetings can seem rather daunting on your first visit, but don't panic. The first thing you must do is sign on, taking your club membership card and new licence to hand in for signature, then take your cart and racewear to scrutineering when they can be checked for compliance and safety. Be prepared to put your suit and helmet on to check for a good fit. Next, go along to the scales where the combined weight of yourself and your cart can be checked against the class minimum. The weight may be checked at the end of the race. At every race meeting you must attend a driver's briefing by the clerk of the course before racing commences. The clerk of the course is the official in charge of the meeting. He'll tell you about the race procedures for the day and any special club rules. So who are the other officials at a cart meeting? Well the final decision on any dispute will come down to the MSA steward. 
Safety is of paramount importance and the technical officials are called scrutineers. One of them will be checking to make sure your cart is not too noisy. Extra personal accident insurance is your responsibility, but if you're unfortunate enough to have a crash, a full team of paramedics are on hand with all the latest medical kit and an ambulance. At events held under a permit issued by the MSA, public liability insurance for the organising club and officials is taken care of by the MSA using part of your entry fees. Marshals play a vital part in proceedings. There will be a flag marshal at every post and a paddock marshal to make sure that the carts take up their correct dummy grid positions. With up to 30 carts or more in a race, accurate results are essential, so obviously the results team have an important role to play. Before racing gets underway, you have at least three laps of practice. Use this time well to familiarise yourself with the circuit. It's also a good idea to walk the circuit beforehand, paying special attention to the location of the circuit exit lane. There might be a time practice for you to establish your grip position for the first heat, or many clubs operate a system where the first entry received gets pole position for the first heat. As a novice, you'll automatically start at the back of the grid anyway, whilst the other drivers will get the equivalent of a front, middle and back grid position in three heats leading up to a final. Points are given for the finishing positions in the heats and used to determine the place on the grid for the final. So even as a novice, potentially you could end up on pole position for the final race of the day. Remember to regularly check the notice board for results and for your grid positions, or it may be in the programme. Listen out carefully for announcements and give yourself plenty of time to get your cart out onto the dummy grid. The grid official will give a signal for the race to get underway. If your cart has a pull start or electric start, you will be asked to start your engine or in the case of a cart without a clutch, you will need a pusher to get you going. Once out onto the track, the field must stay in their grid positions for the formation lap. It's the responsibility of the pole sitter to control the speed of the field and it's your duty to stay in your grid position and follow his pace and not to weave about. As you approach the start line, the lights will be red. Once the starter decides he is satisfied, only then will the lights go out and the race gets underway. But remember, you mustn't overtake until you've crossed the start line. Some circuits have tram lines on the approach to the start and you must stay within them and not accelerate until after the yellow line. In the case of long circuit gearbox racing, a slow rolling start is used. This is because of high gear ratios making standing starts difficult and it's safer for the larger grids. However, on short circuits, gearbox carts and sometimes direct drive carts with clutches will usually have a more conventional standing start controlled by either lights or the national flag. Don't worry if you get left behind by the leaders in your first couple of races. Be calm and remember the track techniques we covered in this video. And above all, enjoy yourself and try not to spin. When the race is over, shown by the chequered flag, do not do an extra lap. Slow down, raise your arm and follow the leaders into Park Ferme, the name for the area where the carts may be checked. As a novice, the MSA steward will be observing your driving and if satisfied will sign your upgrade card for collection at the end of the meeting. Between heats there will be time to look at your data logging if you have any and adjust your cart setup to improve its performance before the final. The more you get to know your cart, the better you can adjust it to the circuit and weather conditions. At meetings with a large entry there may be A and B finals so it's important to check which one you are in. If you've only made it into the B final, don't despair, all is not lost because a top four finish in the B final and that will put you onto the back of the grid for the A final and although it will take an exceptional performance, it's not unheard of for people to win from there. There is another class of racing called endurance racing where races will be anything from one hour to 24 hours long. There will be stops in the pits for refuelling and driver changes. Now as a top finisher, your engine may be required for examination by the scrutineer whilst you collect your licence signature card, head off to face the Whiting Press and proudly take the top of the podium to receive your trophy. Don't forget to thank the marshals and officials if you get the chance. In fact, you may like to offer to marshal yourself on occasion. 
Well, that's the end of this introduction to karting. I hope you've learned a few new things about the sport and are ready to take the next step to getting your race license. But just before we finish a few words of wisdom, don't ever forget why you started racing in the first place. It's because it's a huge amount of fun. Motorsport is a great way to learn life skills, gaining confidence, self-belief, and self-discipline. However, by its nature from time to time, it may result in incidents where you may be denied a race win, perhaps, because of another driver's error in judgment, possibly causing you to be pushed off the track. Now, never allow such incidents to cause the red mist to descend and for you to take action in retribution that can cause other drivers to be injured. The correct way to take action is always to speak to the clerk of the course after the race and ask him to investigate anything you're not happy about. You will often find that before you even get back to Park Ferme, the other driver has already been called up to answer for his driving standards. There is absolutely no place in the sport for drivers, mechanics or dads taking matters into their own hands, either on or off the track after the race. The MSA have procedures in place to make sure as far as possible that everyone has a safe and enjoyable day's racing one of the reasons you should be racing at MSA events in the first place. Well, that's it for now. I hope to see you in the near future. Goodbye.